into presentation mode. This is Sean Dolan with Virtual Technologies, and I'm hoping that everybody on here can see a big screen that's got a picture of the Grand Canyon here in my home state on fire. And uh, can you verify that for me, Steve? Because I can no longer see the Teams window, so I just want to verify that I'm rolling here. Yes, we're good, Sean. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. And uh, just a bit of an introduction uh, for Virtual Technology and Sean Dolan. Uh, I met Sean about five years ago. Um, he was very excited about this technology, and uh, so was I. And uh, Sean's been participating in the conference for several years. We very much appreciate that. The conference this year is August 18th to the 20th. And uh, so without further ado, I'll turn the presentation over to Sean. Go ahead, Sean. Okay, thanks, Steve. Appreciate the introduction. and. Uh... And just a shout out to the 4C is one of the best conferences for me. It has been since it started. So I encourage everybody to go to the 4C conference. Uh, unfortunately, it's in August, not February this year, but it, that does not mean that the educational benefit will not be as good or better. It just means that the weather is going to be a little hotter. What you see here on the uh, on the screen is the uh, is the Grand Canyon. What you see is white smoke and black smoke. And we did this, uh, this picture as our introduction so that we could differentiate between white and blacks and anybody that's uh, that's ever been to a smoke school knows why we did this but uh, the white smoke that you see in this picture is a controlled burn on the north rim and the uh, and the black smoke is a rv on fire over on the north rim parking lot and um, <clears throat> so that's the uh, this is a view from our visibility camera we uh, work with the park service and uh, and do uh, visibility of a lot of our class one areas if you talk about the evolution of docs and where have we been, and uh, this slide <clears throat> pretty much takes us uh, from when, when I started virtual technologies in 2006. Prior to that, I worked um, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a Black World project where we were uh, developing this technology, and, uh, and this technology was, <clears throat> was utilized by the Department of Defense primarily for um, determining the impact of troop strength uh, when we were... Um, when we're marching across the desert and we're trying to figure out how is the dust from the Sherman tanks or the or the black smoke that we're putting out to cover our troop movements or whatever the case may be, how is that smoke going to affect the the health, if you will, or the uh, the strength of the troop when he actually enters the battlefield? And uh, so that was really the genesis of this product, and um, and that product measured a series of different types of contaminants, of which opacity was the very first. Uh, contaminant, if you will, or um, or um, uh, uh, pollutant that we are uh, that we were able to commercialize. So we commercialized this product in uh, 2006, and um, back there you see it as a kind of a blue or blue little line there. To, and then we were running on Sun servers back then. We were running with uh, you know digital cameras that had three and a half inch disk that they used for for magnetic media, and you know it was just. While the system worked, it was way too clunky to be something that anybody was going to be hauling around in the field. I mean, we were in a Humvee, and <laughs> we were pressed for room. So at any route, um, we migrated that into a DOCS2 environment where we effectively separated a lot of the components, made it significantly faster, and made it run on a laptop. So we had a laptop along with a with a camera, and that camera had a timer, and uh, and that was our we put them into a nice little hard pack case, and that became the Docs Two kit, if you will, and uh, and that's what we went into the first set of trials with. Those trials were done at uh, Hill Air Force Base, and Fort Hood, and Norfolk Naval Shipyard, a series of DoD facilities. Again, this was being funded under the Environmental. Technology and Certification Program, or ESTCP, Environment Security Technology Certification Program, is what that S is for. And um, and when we went through those trials, this also included a trial that was with Pennsylvania and Virginia and uh, Maryland, a few other folks that uh, that came to that Virginia testing. And uh, the conclusion of that was that effectively, what we needed was a product where we could have direct oversight as to what was going on in the field. And um, it became obvious to us that that a product whereby you were preserving what the actual readings were required a lot more training than a method nine certification in the field. You know, I mean, I'm a firm believer in method nine, and you'll never hear me say that that that, that method does not have does not have merit because it absolutely does. 
And it is a very good method and it's been around a long time. <clears throat> the downside to the method is that there's no real reproducible documentation to it. That's the only real big fall. The bad news about pictures and the good news about pictures yes, is yes. that it is very reproducible. <laughs> so as a re I'm sorry, is there a, is there a question? No, OK. So at any route, the um, <clears throat> so, so we decided at the end of the Virginia trials that we really needed to move this into a web based environment. And the primary driver behind that was that we needed good oversight on what was happening out in the field. So what we no longer wanted to happen was somebody would take a picture in the field, move that picture onto a laptop, utilize our software to determine an opacity and then issue, if you will, a citation for that and or issue a pass for that without some type of oversight. Um, and so we moved, we migrated this product into a web based environment so that if Arizona DEQ inspectors were out taking pictures, when they upload them to the web, we have an oversight function, if you will, that can look at those pictures and say, yes, those are good pictures for the determination of opacity or no, those are not good pictures for the determination of opacity and then immediately get the person on the phone and, and tell them exactly why that is and see if we can get a new set of pictures. So it gave us the ability to have a really good quality assurance program, not only on our training and on our system, but on the use of our system as it extended out into the field. So, um, so as a result, that web-based platform, which was primarily utilized for the for the dust surveys, was utilized heavy by the CARB facilities when we were doing all the CARB trials. It is that web-based platform that did all of our 301 stack test studies to verify that we were no longer limited by diameter of stack, nor are we limited by fugitives. So, we really focused into that area, and then. About that time, because of computer security issues and security problems and things of that nature, you, you anybody who's in the IT business has heard of a thing called software as a service, which became kind of the new way of running in a web-based environment. The real difference between Docs2 Web and Docs2 SaaS is a security wrapper around them, essentially. The, um, the web environment was not as secure as the SaaS environment is significantly more secure and has been uh, <clears throat> and has been uh, certified on the fed platform for software as a service applications so basically in 2012 right about the time that alternative method 082 was promulgated by the epa the docs sas began and we've been running that way ever since the difference what you see between the blue sas line which represents opacity and the purple SAS line. The purple SAS line is Docs 3, which will be released sometime in the very near future. Depends upon how quickly I can finalize these 301 studies. The COVID thing kind of screwed me up on that. Uh, but once we get those, those studies done, then we'll be uh, releasing this to not only quantify opacity in the field, but also particulate matter in the field via a picture. So uh, that's kind of the future. That's where we're going. And I don't want to bog anybody down on that. That is not available today. What is available today is Docs2 SAS production giving you opacity numbers. That's what we are currently certified to do. That's what our standards do. And that's what we are currently promoting. Um, but there's always a future. And as I told you early on, the, the development of this was multi-contaminants. And we were able to get opacity commercialized. And now we're moving towards PM to be commercialized. After that, it'll be volatiles and some of the other things that it does. This slide here gives you a kind of a kind of a basically what I just told you only in written in write, written form, so that you don't necessarily have to take notes on that last slide. But a couple of the key points in this is that this is not you know a new technology. I mean, back in 2000 2005, we published a standard through the EPA Technology Transfer Network for the determination of visible emissions using photographic analysis. And, uh, and that standard, PRE008, was, <clears throat> was then migrated into what we know today as alternative method 082. 
And essentially we went, we had to, once we put out that standard, we were told, no, you have to have a consensus standard group that has this. So we started a group in ASTM. The first ASTM standard was promulgated in 09 with limits on it that it could not be used for stacks bigger than seven feet. Not because we didn't believe it would work for stacks bigger than seven feet, but because the largest stack in the Department of Defense was six foot eight, and that was at Dayton, Ohio, and that was as big as we had tried it on. So we did those 301 studies that you saw on the previous slide on stacks that we, we did uh, Navajo Generating Station, which actually just got demolished <laughs> about six months ago. But at any route, um, but that that place had, you know, thousand, you know, I think it was two, three hundred foot diameter stacks that were a thousand feet tall. So, and again, and those were wet scrub stacks. So we were able to uh, utilizing method nine people competing against cameras, if you will, to come up with the exact same numbers over and over and over and over and over again. And that's what removed those limits. So the product has been well tested and the EPA is not easy to get an alternative method approved through, particularly an alternative method that has broadly applicable status. And, uh, and if this were a certification course, I'd be telling you that's on the test. You, know, you are going to have to know what a broadly applicable standard is as opposed to an alternative standard. So there's basically three levels of alternative standards. You can have an alternative standard that is specific to a particular source in a particular environment. Yeah. Have an alternative standard that's good for a particular pollutant in a particular category of sources or you can have an alternative method that is broadly applicable. And broadly applicable meaning it can be used for anything that it is an alternative to. So if you read alternative method 082, it reads that it can be used in lieu of method nine for all subparts of 40 CFR 60, 61, 63. So if it smokes, we can read it. Federal permits are not required. And uh, but state permits are, and uh, so you do need to uh, to check with your state regulator if you're if you're going to utilize this product. The um, we have now moved from ASTM D seventy five twenty oh nine to a sixteen version, and that D seventy five twenty sixteen, the last two digits being the year that the last version was was published, um, has this system being uh, applicable to stationary sources, mobile sources, and fugitive sources. So the key point is, is broadly applicable, so it can be used anywhere where method nine can be used. If we continue the the uh, the the approach after we became a broadly applicable standard, then we went into dust, and we wanted to make sure that we were able to do dust. We set up some long path transmissometers out here in Arizona, and where we got lots of dust to play with, and we were able to uh, to do a study on dust. We did a study on the seven foot limits that I talked about. The EPA in Region Five promulgated a, 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 a essentially a uh, an opinion from the EPA's um, OECA Office of Enforcement and Corrective Action, I think. Um, at any route, uh, as to what is what's the value of using this, and we became uh, noted as the most credible evidence as a as a result of that opinion. Uh, in 2015, we were published in the Feral Alloy Niche app as a mandated system for the use of process fugitive emissions. Now um, in 16 we we put out a new version of the standard and in 17 uh, the ferro alloy niche app was signed into law. The um, 18 we began the the, uh, the development of a thing called flare watch you're going to hear more about in this presentation here as we go and in 19 we did the heavy duty diesel INM system you're also going to hear a lot more about that. And now we're into the auto detect for uh, for our production clients, whereby essentially we've got cameras watching flares, and anytime there's smoke, it triggers an alarm, and that goes to the control room and tells them something's going on out here on your flare. You got to deal with it. And uh, 2021, this year we're gonna we're gonna begin the implementation of our um, heavy duty diesel, where essentially we are measuring the opacity of diesel trucks as they're moving 70 miles an hour down the freeway. And uh, that's a uh, kind of a still in an experimental mode, but it does work. And uh, so we're integrating that with a number of states on their uh, on their automated toll roads. The uh, the biggest thing that happened to us in terms of internationally is that the World Bank bought into this idea. Um, in order to spend World Bank money, now this is General Electric that one of my bigger customers that really uh, brought this to the table for me. 
shout out to GE if anybody on the on the on the webinar is, is from there. The um at any route the they're building coal-fired power plants all over the world and those uh, those coal-fired power plants being funded by World Bank money and as a result of that they needed a guarantee that they would not generate more than 20 percent opacity and you know for somebody to say that in a paper is one thing to have pictures of it running full tilt and being at 15 percent is a definite deal closer and uh, so that's kind of where we went and we've been uh, very fortunate to be uh, to be backed by the World Bank with respect to opacity. The, uh, these are some of the uh, some of the first uh, customers that, that we had. This this slide was actually developed. I'm trying to see if anybody in here is old customer uh, or is a new customer. Now these are all so everybody on this slide has been using this software for at least seven years. Uh, I think the GATX is probably the newest, and they're seven years in. The uh, the rest of them are ten years plus, and uh, we've got some really good stories to tell. Uh, Kinder Morgan in the pipeline business out here in Arizona. We started with them, and three years later, because we could document zero emissions coming out of their natural gas generators, not just on a piece of paper with zeros written on it, but rather with pictures as well, we were able to petition the state of Arizona and remove all opacity requirements from their transfer stations in the state of Arizona, and now we're doing the same thing over in New Mexico. So it's something where pictorial evidence that is generated by these cameras allows you to have a very strong case with your regulator with respect to removing requirements. And uh, so Kendra Morgan's got a really good story to tell about that. Connecticut has a good story to tell about that. Belco has a really good story to tell about that. Arcita Metal and many, many others. So. Uh, so essentially, the idea is, and, and uh, Hawaii Independent Energy is probably has the best story because, again, they're natural gas generators and standby generators that the odds of being able to generate an opacity are pretty slim. But, you know, the regulators need help in, in verifying that, and nothing tells help like a picture. So people ask, how does this work? And again, uh, you know, back to that slide where I was talking about the trials. One of the things that we realized early on when we were doing the the trials with the DoD sites and the and the regulatory agencies of Virginia and Pennsylvania was that we needed an oversight function. That you know the idea of opacity in the field was great, but we didn't feel comfortable. We being virtual technologies unless we had some means to be able to to say, you know, what numbers are we really generating? And, you know, back then, you know, you're talking about computer software where operating systems are changing and codexes are changing and displays are changing. And, you know, you can imagine, you all live through it. You know, how many different laptops did you have from 2000 to 2010? And, uh, and, and there's just, you know, this constant state of evolution. So we wanted to make sure that we had a means built into the day-to-day -day product that would give us direct oversight and make sure that everything being reported by docs was good. And if there was any question to it, that there was a procedure in place to catch that error if that error did occur. So our software, every time it starts up, has a self-test routine in it, runs through the last certification set of images, which there are 300 of them and redraws the boxes in the same exact place and it doesn't get the answer then it get, doesn't get the right answer then it errors and and it sends me a message and then we shut the whole thing down till we can fix the problem fortunately that has not happened since 2007 and, uh, and then we fixed that error and ever since then uh, we have not had had a startup that did not uh, that did not pass the self-test but it's built in so that in the event that that occurs we have the ability to catch it before it perpetuates into a whole bunch of bad, if you will, opacity observations. So how does it work? So you take a picture in the field, and these pictures are, if you're using a handheld camera, <clears throat> we have timers on these cameras, so they actually take a picture every 15 seconds. Another one of the stories I like to tell is when we were doing those 301 studies, we had a 100% failure rate of humans being able to actually <laughs> write down an answer every 15 seconds when they were timed. So we built an application that allowed us to force feed so that they could not enter, except for between second number 14 and second number 15. 
And um, and that's how we aligned the numbers to make sure that because the, the timers, you know, they're going to take a picture of 15 seconds till the battery runs out. But humans, not so much. So at any route, you're going to take these pictures. And nowadays, this is a video camera. This is a Sony CX high definition recorder. Actually, we don't video anymore. We just record it right to one of these things. And um, so you gab that video that transfers over to your handheld if you're an inspector or somebody who moves from place to place to place to place, performing visible emission observations. This device is, is something that'll pay for itself in a minute the first time you use it. If you're somebody who's looking at the same sources over and over and over again, then this device is more overhead than it's worth and it's better to just go right straight from your camera to your computer, do a save as from the last one, attach the new pictures and send it away. Because you don't change your position, your stack doesn't change. The only thing it changes is the time that you did it. So the sun might might be in a little bit different place and you'll notice that we note where the sun is in these pictures here. The um, <clears throat> But for the most part, your location is always the same, your stack's always the same, your name's always the same those types of things. So it's quicker to go straight to the computer and up versus if you're somebody who's transient, i.e. you're a consultant doing stack test or you're an inspector for the EPA or an inspector for the Ohio or Wisconsin or, or whomever, then uh, where you're mobile a lot, then this way is the way to do it. And essentially what happens here is you turn on your tablet, you're walking around on a Google map, the weather streams in from NOAA across the top band, and that's true whether you're in the United States or Brazil or wherever NOAA covers the Earth <laughs> with respect to, to weather. And then you have a compass here. You click on that compass. It turns on the, the uh, angle meter inside of your device. You get an angle of view. I'm okay. I'm okay. And uh, and then you grab your your icons here for your source, your, your, uh, your blue circle for your uh, observation, your yellow X. You click on here, and it, and uh, and that's how it determines where all of your distances are and what direction you're looking and things of that nature. Attach the pictures and upload them to the system. Once you upload them to the system and send them for analysis, now an expert at analyst, somebody who does this every day, all day long, that's what they do for a living, is going to be looking at those pictures. And they're going to draw two boxes on those pictures, one that's going to go in the plume and one that's going to go outside of the plume. And what the software does is run the sum of squares calculation across that with some proprietary uh, statistics that we use for the bounds of statistical significance against the three dimensions of the pixelization within that box. Now that's a mouthful. Uh, so summarize it to math as happens and the math compares those two, those two boxes and determines what the opacity number is, which is displayed above. You do that on all of the basic pictures, and then you generate this nice, pretty report. You notice that this front page of the report looks a lot like the VEO forms that you have, only instead of a stick man and a bunch of uh, hand-drawn pencil, where's my son kind of thing, this is that exact same map that you saw when you were on your handheld or you saw when you were on the location tab of your computer. So there's enough detail on that map to actually be able to see what's going on and where you were and where the sun was and things of that nature. And then in addition, we attach an appendix that has the actual pictures. These are the coordinates of where the actual boxes were drawn. This is the stream of what the weather was at the timestamp of that picture and the timestamp in the camera of the picture. And then the opacities that were determined from that picture are displayed there, in addition to being displayed here and on, on the report. The front page of the report is a facsimile that can be used directly instead of a VEO report, but we always ask everybody to store not only that, but also the, the appendix that so you have the pictures as well. So essentially, it's a nice, pretty report. The other question people have is, well, how does this really compare with humans? And let me make one comment here. Remember back to that, this is a broadly applicable standard slide. My reference standard is method nine. Therefore, I cannot be better than method nine. Okay, that's my reference. So I can be as good, but I can't be better. But um, so with that said, let's tell you what our experience is. So we audit the CARB Smoke School program, did for years and years and years. And when CARB puts on a, a, a school, let's say they're out in San Dimas or, or El Dorado Park, you know, they got 120 people out there and they're all looking at these smoke generators. 
And of the people that pass that school, the average deviation count is 23. Now, a deviation, for those of you that have never been to smoke school, if the transmissometer reads 10 and you guessed 15, you're off by one increment of five. So you would take a one deviation count for that particular reading. You add up those deviation counts for a set of 25 readings, and whatever that deviation count is, is the number that we're talking about here. So the people that passed those CARB courses missed by a overall 20, 23 deviations, if you will, in a set in any set of 25. And docs running that same exact school, we never, our deviation counts are always 15 or lower. The lower the deviation count, the closer you were to the, to the transmissometer reading. And then remembering that those transmissometers float 3%, i.e. why we round to five for method nine. <clears throat> and so what's more correct is it, uh, is it the rounded transmissometer or is it the docs reading? So bottom line is, is we're not better than method nine. We are as good as method nine. Where we get better than method nine is not in our accuracy, but rather in our documentation and in our ability to reproduce what was actually seen at the time that the observation was performed. So that's, you know, if you say, what are our one ups on method nine? It is that reproducibility, repeatability, credible evidence side of the equation, not that we are more accurate than method nine, because that's not a true statement. Method nine is my reference standard, and I can only be as accurate as method nine is. And uh, so with that said, I won't, uh, I won't belabor that anymore, but what I will tell you is that we have been tested in the clouds, in the rain, in the snow, with trees and buildings and you name it, in the background, freeways, <clears throat> and, uh, and we always have passed the smoke schools. And um, I passed a white out smoke, a smoke, a white smoke school in Salt Lake City, in a white out snowstorm. There were a hundred people in that parking lot. Not a single human passed it, but our cameras did. We're also uh, we certify out in California for day and night, so we're also certified for night. Uh, for those of you who need night capability, and close and far, because our cameras can zoom, we can reach out a long ways to be able to perform a method nine observation. Now. You know, the, the, the method nine on that reads a clear view to the source. So as you get too far away and you're in a polluted environment or a, 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 a bad air situation, then, uh, then you're going to start increasing the opacity through the, through the visibility aspects of, uh, of that distance. So you do got to be careful of, you know, being five miles away and taking, a, and taking a, a, an opacity reading if the visibility for that day is not five miles plus, so to speak, right? So um, I have a lot of regulatory agencies in the West where, you know, we've got a lot of wide open space out here and it's real easy to get a mile, two miles away and be able to zoom in on sources. Uh, not so much back East where you got, you know, it's flatter and you got a lot more trees and things of that nature. So, so that really depends, you know, as far as how far away you can be based on the visibility and the topology and the, uh, and the world that you're living in. So people say, well, how does this actually work? Well, at the end of the day, what we're doing is we are capturing a picture and then we're simulating what a human would do. We're saying, where am I going to read this? And wherever I'm going to read this, I'm going to drop a yellow box right into that plume. And what am I going to use as my background? And I'm going to drop an orange box where I'm going to use my background. Again, the software calculates the difference only between those two boxes irrespective of anything else that's in that picture. And that's how it comes up with an opacity. Well, what if I don't know for sure whether there's water in that? Then I'm gonna click my water filter. And because we have time to look at a picture whereby a human in the field does not, we have time, if you will, to second guess ourselves and to make sure that we're not reading where there's water, to make sure that we're not reading where there is lots of, where we are reading, if you will, where there's lots of PM10, or where there's lots of PM2.5 to 10, or where there's lots of PM2.5 or smaller. These are the filters that we're utilizing to be able to determine where exactly are we going to put these boxes. So there's not a question at the end of the observation 
whether or not the reading was performed in or out of the water. And that really has become probably the number one debated thing. I, I had no concept of how much water was being used to scrub stacks and flares and everything else. But uh, there's a lot of water out there. And, um, and this is a means to be able to pictorially say, no, that was measured outside of that black. So the water filter here is the black. And you notice that the box is right at the tip of the water. So uh, same true here. This is, again, the PM10 filter, the PM7 filter, and the PM2.5 filter. So we have the ability to apply these filters to determine where to do the box. So it's not necessarily, again, that we're better than method 9. It's just we got more time is really what it comes down to. You know, the, the method 9 reader's got to look and write, look and write, look and write every 15 seconds. And, you know, if you've been doing it a long time like Jody or me or, or Arthur, one of the gentlemen on this uh, on this webinar, you get really good at it. And, and there's no question that that, that 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 is a viable method. This is just a means to be able to perform that method in a very, very well-documented manner when you're not doing them on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's talk a little bit about the different types of products that we have that we utilize the same technology. So where we've been thus far is identifying how the technology works and the baseline opacity capability. That baseline opacity capability, as anybody who's ever done method nine knows, is a, is dependent upon your position. And so you can't say that this is the opacity of 80% if you're looking into the sun. And you can't say that this is being measured someplace where there's not water, particularly if you're looking in the sun or if that sun's not, not directly behind you. So the rules, if you will, for obtaining the pictures, for the digital means of doing this, and the eye means of doing this, i.e. method nine, are the same. The sun's got to be behind you if it's up. And, you know, again, we do it at night, so there's not necessarily sun at night. But whatever the illuminating light for the plume needs to be behind the camera. And uh, and that's you know the, the number one rule of all of it. And then the next is you want to be perpendicular to, to the travel of the plume because you want to be reading across the shortest path length of that plume. So you don't want that plume blowing right at the camera or right away from the camera. Also true with method nine. So with method nine, you want to be perpendicular to plume travel. You want to be three stack heights back, which reduces your your angle of view. Same is true here. So you want sun behind you, perpendicular to plume travel, three stack heights back, just like you were method nine. And that's where you set up your camera and you begin to uh, to take your, your observations. The difference between these two cameras is this is a single button, records an MP4 file. And then when you upload that using your handheld device or your computer, we cut that file into a series of one JPEG every 15 seconds to perform the analysis and or you can use a camera, in which case you have to have a timer to be able to get a picture every 15 seconds. And I say that because our software does check on that 15 seconds, and if you don't use a timer, the odds that you will screw that up are way, way high, at least into the 80%. And I have a lot of people call me up and, oh, well, we just, we could just change that timestamp by a second. And I'm like, you know, I can change that timestamp, but that like, invalidates your whole thing. Are you sure you want me to do that or you just go do it again? And uh, so at any route, you know, the good news about this is that it has incredible error checking all the way through it. So it doesn't allow you to make a mistake. The bad news about it is it has incredible error checking all the way through it and it won't let you make a mistake. So <clears throat> you can't fool it. You know, it knows where that sun is. As soon as you say this is where I was standing and it reads that timestamp off those pictures, it boom, up pops the sun. And uh, so you don't have the ability to say, well, it really, the sun really wasn't there on that day because right? it knows what the sun is. And so those are, uh, you know, the, the cross checks that make it happen. This again is kind of your inspector or your consultant type of package where it's mobile and designed for mobility in the field, designed to capture information in the field in real time and upload to get the observations done. This is our is our flare watch and our heavy duty I and M program, and essentially what these are doing is we're using uh, surveillance cameras. Some of these surveillance cameras are mounted on overhead um, toll racks. Other ones are mounted in uh, 
in refineries, but essentially what they're doing is they're watching the source or sources. They are streaming to a local set of platform. This is being captured and, uh, and maintained for your 24 hour, seven day a week log. And then we have some means to trigger, that's either a control room switch or it's an auto detect switch or it's a every day at four o'clock type, type of a schedule where we essentially do a cut based on time and timestamp out of this repository and we upload that six minute chunk to the to the doc system then our software as a service we create the opacity observation and then send it back to the customer so we can stream 24 7 and then take a you know a sniplet and say well we want to do one observation that was eight in the morning we want to do another one that was 10 in the morning and we want to switch cameras to the one on the other side and we want to do an observation that was three in the afternoon and five in the afternoon so the uh, so it's, it's an ability to be able to utilize multiple cameras to kind of surround a source if you will so you can ensure that the uh, that the sun is always in the correct position and uh, and be able to record so essentially that's what that does this is a uh, electronic complaint system uh, being implemented heavily in the bay area of the of, uh, of northern california but essentially is a uh, is a means to be able to say, well, I just saw something that was smoking horrible and I want to report it to my regulator. So you can take a picture on your cell phone that will immediately attach a map of where you were when you took that picture and what the weather was. And then you can forward that on to your regulatory agency and they can go about doing the investigation. Again, either way on any of these, you're going to get a nice pretty report and be able to, uh, that's, that's real readable. <laughs> and uh, and very uh, very preservable. This is a multi-point method 22 survey and uh, that's another means of being able to look at a whole lot of potentially visible emission sources at one time, perform a 10 minute survey and say, you know, I'm gonna sit here and watch these three different sources and I'll click on them when I see them smoking or making some type of a visible emission and then click on them again when I when when that goes away and in the event that I'm seeing visible emissions for greater than whatever the threshold is that you set, five seconds or 10 seconds or a minute or however, cumulative over that 15 minute watch period or five minute watch period, you also set that parameter, then uh, then it'll trigger at the end, ask you to take, ask you to record a picture, you record a picture and it produces a nice pretty method 22 report. So to kind of break into them individually, this is flare watch. So again, we're uh, locally mounted and intrinsically weather tight cameras. These cameras have uh, have humidity vestibules on them so that they you know, always have clear view. They also have auto washers on them. But essentially what you're doing is you're you're running a, a continuous video feed onto a local server. That local server then decides, OK, we're going to cut out this chunk. And that decision is usually made by the control operators and uh, so we look at the control operator logs and we can see that these parameters were at this level during this time of the day, then we know well, usually that's when we're smoking. So let's grab that time from this server and upload it to here. When that happens and we get an observation that looks like this, we then scroll down through these pictures, cut a six minute chunk out, i.e. 24 pictures and perform an observation. So these pictures just scroll through and we would say we want that one to start with, scroll down 24 of them, end with that one, and let's do the opacity on only that set. And then that set marks the opacity, if you will, for the overall timestamp that we cut loose. So uh, this is a, is, is a product that, um, that we've been working on now since, uh, well, I guess that was uh, the JW Marriott, um, 4C conference in San Antonio. <laughs> We've been working diligently on this ever since that conference, whenever that one was. The um, this is our uh, is our uh, multi-site survey. Again, this one is still using your eyeballs, if you will, smoke no smoke, but um, but then records whether you had smoke or not based off the pictures, and uh, is a very uh, efficient way of being able to do uh, multi-point. Method 22 surveys, if you will. This is the overhead uh, rack mount uh, for the uh, for the heavy duty vehicle inspection program. And here 
what we're doing is we're essentially uh, ghosting a, a bubble around these cars as they approach. And then within that bubble, we're looking for this. And uh, a lot of times these things nowadays are routed underneath the truck. So we read both front and back of the truck so that we can look for irregular smoke patterns coming out of that truck. If we see an irregular smoke pattern, then we record license plate and or record trans, trans um, transmitters that are typically on the toll roads up on the windshields. And, uh, and then whoever the appropriate uh, legal folks can pull that truck over and do a detailed inspection of the truck. But we don't have to stop the freeway. And that was the, the objective of this was we wanted to be able to find the high emitting trucks, but we don't want to have to stop the freeway to to do that because we can't stand the traffic jam. And uh, so that's kind of where we went. The Coalition for Clean Air, this is our uh, community program. Uh, this is being used in the 617 operations, um, Assembly Bill 617 out in California, where essentially they're looking at monitoring air quality in the um, underserviced, if you will, underprivileged areas where there tends to be lots of pollution in California like the 710 triangle going into in and out of long beach like the alameda port in uh, in uh, in the bay area so again you just uh where am i who am i attach a picture and then send in a spot the smoke to the regulatory agency for them to follow up on it the good news about this from a regulator's perspective is they know where the person was standing when they took the picture they know of the picture and they know the weather so they have the information to determine, you know, is this something where somebody was looking right into the sun and I just need to call them up and explain to them that that's not the way we measure opacity? Or is this something that really requires me to get in my truck and go out there and do a and do an opacity observation? So that's kind of where those are. How are the numbers on them? And I'll leave this to you, you guys to read because we're because we're tight on time. But um, <clears throat> various different sources and mobile sources, whether they're trains, whether they're trucks, whether they're natural disasters or forest fires, they're all generating opacity and opacity can be measured as well as particulate now. So here's where, here's where we're going. This is the future. Let me emphasize the future. This is not part of the current standard. So uh, this is where we're headed to and we are looking for people, innovative companies that want us to, they want to become the, um, the, <laughs> the beta cases, if you will, for this. But essentially this will revolutionize particulate monitoring so instead of uh, having, if you will, canisters that have filters on them out there where you're sucking air through a series of filters or you're using the, the breeze of the air to, uh, to, to populate the filters, what we're doing is taking a picture and then from that picture able to speciate what the particulate is within that cloud. And the way we do that is by utilizing, or the way we, let me, let me rephrase, the way that we QA ourselves to verify that we're getting the right answer is through laser. And uh, so the green laser, which is the closest to the human light spectrum, is uh, the one that you see in this, in, this, uh, in this photograph. There's also a red and a blue laser. Um, and uh, those give us the speciation attributes. And uh, if you, it's based on the particle size, essentially where it comes. Again, shout out to GE and some of the testing we were able to do with GE whereby we were able to, knowing because we had a sim in, in the stack, we knew what the particulate was, we knew what the opacity was, and so we could monitor it from afar, utilize our cameras to be able to determine just how close we were able to get to that sim. And uh, this graph, and I won't belabor this too heavy, but, um, oops, let me go back. This graph here, the sim is the yellow line, docks are the, are the purple triangles, and the method nine readers are the green dots. So if you average up the method nine guys, they hit the line just like they should. We hit the line dead on just like we should, but we also aligned really well with respect to the PM. And uh, and this is kind of what started that whole arena. So we continue to build our uh, our library of information about that. We were fortunate to, uh, to be uh, utilized by Freeport McMoran, a big mining operation out here in Arizona where we had a uh, PM10 non-attainment issue out in a place called Ajo, Arizona, where they had a historic open pit mine. Uh, long story short, we needed to uh, fix the, uh, the tailing piles because they were generating too much PM10. Freeport did what they call armoring on the tailing piles. We've now been monitoring that for 
Oh, 90, let's see, 98 weeks was last Sunday, and um, and we were able to prove that even in 40, 45 mile an hour winds, the armor holds tight, and we get no opacity coming off of the uh, coming off the tailing piles. And as a result, the the federal reference monitor that was put out there because of the non-attainment has now registered in attainment, and we are able to get the entire Ajo area out of a non-attainment status because we're able to see what's going on, find a solution, and fix it. So again, you know, not just opacity, but also for the bigger vision. So being able to establish new attainment or non-attainment, being able to get out of opacity requirements on sources that shouldn't have opacity requirements, things of that nature all require pictorial evidence, and that's what we bring to the table. So we're not more accurate than method nine, but we are more reproducible are more repeatable. So back to, remember I was telling you about the laser light. So when we get into the speciation, all the way down to speciation, effectively what we're doing is we mount a camera <clears throat> and within that camera is a prism. We shine an intense white laser into that prism, which breaks it into the entire spectrum of light. Based off of that spectrum of light, we're beaming that directly into the plume. We are now seeing refraction coming off of that. So the closer the particle size matches to the to the wavelength of the light so purple light real short wavelength red light real long wavelength so red light we're seeing particulate in the tens purple lights we're seeing particulates in the 2.5s so we're measuring that scatter and that scatter is what gives us our ability to produce these types of numbers the um, What's the problem with that? Problem with that is when you got bright sun, it drowns out these light beams, right? This works really good at night. It doesn't work also good in the Arizona sunshine. So not only do we need light, but we need a backup means of doing it. And the backup means of doing it is on oscillation or energy generation. So the newer cameras nowadays, and you gotta get into 4K cameras to be able to make this work, but <clears throat> you, we can actually measure the energy intensity difference between pixel to pixel to pixel to pixel which gives us the ability now to utilize energy emittance to cross check our lights and based on that we're able to get these types of numbers so now now today we can tell you that the difference between op the opacity between that area and that area of this picture is 30 percent i.e background clear versus in the smoke and in addition to that this is not part of the standard today but we're looking for volunteers to make it part of the standard, we will be able to tell you that that 30% opacity is made up of <clears throat> PM 20%, PM3 or smaller, 35%, 3 to 7, and 45% above 7. So it gives us the ability to speciate and find the particulate in it. So with that said, we've, uh, we've hit the end of this presentation and uh, we're open for questions. Okay, Sean, okay, Sean, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's amazing. amazing. Great, Great content. content. Love, it. Love, it. Love, it. Love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, there's, there's one there's question, question here. here. Has this been run by any other state agencies such as Texas? And if so, what was their opinion? In Texas, it was approved to be used at all the military facilities. The um, There was a gentleman uh, who was working this in Texas who unfortunately had a tragic accident and died. Um, and uh, so I've been I've been reworking a, a Texas connection, but in uh, 2019 we did a pilot in Texas for the Air Force, and at that point we were we submitted all of our documentation. Um, the gentleman, the gal who uh, did that review, I'm hard pressed to remember her name at this moment, but uh, the. Um, the outcome of it was based on this training. You are uh, you're, sir, you you are qualified to do this training course here in the state of Texas, and uh, and this can be utilized at all the DoD facilities in the state of Texas. So we're still working that because there's contract issues with fence to fence contractors and yeah, uh, doing stuff inside of a <laughs> military installation is never as simple as it should be. And uh, with respect to restrictions on the use of cameras and things of that nature, but we're working through all of those issues. And uh, so there in the state of Texas, uh, as far as I know, I, 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 and I, whoever asked that question, I can forward you the information, uh, but we are approved in the state of Texas. Region six subscribed to this in 2020 for all of the delegatees of region six. 
So TCEQ actually has an active subscription right now to DOCS, as does Department of Louisiana, New Mexico, all of the delegates inside of the city or the state of Texas, Houston, and so forth. So they all have licenses to DOCS, courtesy of uh, Region 6 at the moment. Any other questions? Yes, just one moment here, please. Um, as a newcomer to this method of regulatory compliance, could you elaborate on how opacity limits are determined? Is it based on human health or industry norms? Does it vary by fuel source industry, size of energy source? Um, that may be beyond your scope, Sean. <laughs> yeah, let me just address that one as, as, as simply as I can. We don't set opacity limits. We measure opacity. So, um, yeah. you know, yeah, we have thousands of customers and those customers are have <laughs> tens of thousands of, of sources, so to speak. But with that said, what I can tell you is that we're yet to find a source that we can't measure. But I really could not tell you, you know, what happened in the regulatory process that established that that particular source was going to have a 20% limit or a 5% limit or a 10% limit or and whether that limit was going to be over a six minute average or a three minute average or what have you. So from our perspective, we choose not to know that data because again, we want to maintain our independence. So I don't review any of my customers permits. I don't want to know what their limits are. Because if we know what that is, then one could make the, 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 the assertion that we are biasing our analysis to make sure that they meet their limits. And that's uh, so we choose not to know that. And I have a lot of customers who ask me if I can review their permits and tell them what I think. And my answer is no, you need to hire a, another consulting firm to do that because that would make me impartial if I knew what your limits are. Uh, one of the things that uh, that has been very powerful in the regulatory community out here in Arizona is the fact that virtual technology has no visibility to the permits that are that they are enforcing against. And the same is true with Region 5 and the same is true in Region 6 and the same is true with uh, all of our other regulatory customers. It's, it's a matter of it's a matter of independence and being unbiased. And this system wants to maintain that integrity as hard as we possibly can. So how the opacity limits get set, that's that's up to the regulators and <laughs> and all of the above in your uh, in your list of is it based on sources that based on it, it are, are likely all taken into account. Yeah. But we only do measuring and monitoring and we don't want to know what your limit is. We're just going to give you the honest answer. This is what you're generating. And if that's too high, then that's your problem. Yeah. And of course, uh, the for the um, webinar attendee, for any given standard, you can search uh, the Federal Register and the background information documents. So EPA has that information in something called a background information document. So if you want to know the basis for that, now there is other information from the OMB, and in some cases supporting documents behind bid documents but uh yeah so uh and i appreciate your comment sean you are not the regulator you don't set the limits you're measuring and measuring only and that's a, a mutually exclusive circle from you by definition because you would not want a conflict of interest um so i i understand that Okay, Sean, thank you very much. A fantastic, amazing presentation. Uh, uh, I've known you for years, learned a lot today, my, uh, a, lot, a lot myself. Uh, and this is a technology that will continue to develop uh, as your later slides show, and uh, a technology that will uh, have a, a larger and larger impact over time. Uh, as you're able to use the uh, segmentation by uh, particle size uh, to an opacity ranges to differentiate. Yeah, the speciation has really become a, you know, a lot of people asked me for that way, way, way back. And 
There was a study years ago, I mean, years and years and years ago, uh, they, known as the Emory study that talked about there was no correlation between opacity and PM. And, uh, and, and at that time, they were trying to speciate PM and uh, instead of just doing a, a giant mass. And, and what we have found now, and of course, they didn't have digital cameras back in the 70s like we have today. So what we've been able to prove now is that there is a correlation between opacity and mass, and that correlation can be can be speciated. So one of the things that we're really looking into from a from a development perspective, in a market perspective, are the smaller sources. You know, you you it costs a lot of money to run a full on stack test, and if you can use opacity as a surrogate which most regulatory agencies will allow you if you're using digital cameras like Arizona, then uh, then then you can you you can do the stack test, if you will, or meet that stack test requirement utilizing opacity, um, which just makes it, you know, I mean, that's where you start that cost savings that you're talking about, Steve. That's, you know, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, smoke school is 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 fast and it's and it's and it's good. And, you know, if you can do it and you live across the street from a smoke school, it's not a bad thing. And I don't ever tell people to not go to smoke school because they're using docs other than you don't have to. And, uh, you know, I mean, oftentimes it's good to have that kind of awareness of your maintenance people walking around, being able to look and see what smoke is and what's not. But on the other side of the coin, if you want those readings to be able to be repurposed into lower requirements not having to do as many stack tests, being able to defend yourself against the Sierra Club that's standing out outside of the fence. You know, those types of issues is where this product really shines. And if you ever get in litigation over opacity, that's where you're saving six digits with this product. Yeah, I understand what you're saying is sometimes this product can be used as a cost savings measure. Sometimes this product is complementary to an existing opacity nine or uh, uh, opacity reader, uh, mm -hmm. so that it provides substantiation uh, of, of a of a human yeah. reading. Yeah. It just it just backs up that human's readings with a <laughs> with a set of pictures. <laughs> pictures say a thousand words. That's yeah. that's what the judges always say. <laughs> I'm going to allow the pictures because they say a thousand words, and every time that gets said by a judge. The matter gets settled in within 24 hours. So, yeah. okay. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, this concludes today's webinar. Uh, thank you very much to the attendees, and uh, look forward to seeing you at the 4C conference, August 18th to the 20th in Austin, Texas. Take care. Thank you. And everybody who is on this webinar, um, I'll get a list of that. You have now made it through section one of the five part series it takes to be certified. And uh, so you'll get credit for this section. And uh, if you want to get a certification and your name's on that list, then, then we'll work on it. It's, it's a lot faster to go through two, three, four and five than one, two, three, four and five. So you've made it one fifth of the way. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. All Sorry. For your can we have a presentation and the recording? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. The recording will be available on YouTube and on our web, uh, 4C conference web page. Excellent. Excellent. Thank okay. You. And, the, Thank uh, you. And, and the full certification course, by the way, is all is being done this year yet again at uh, the 4C conference. And then it will be, all you got to do is register for the 4C and show up to my class and you'll walk away with a certificate and be ready to uh, go buy your camera and and, um, and start doing this. And one other point that I didn't make going all the way through this, I just real quick, is that the cameras that we're using here, you buy at Best Buy or Walmart. These are $220 Sony CX HDR recorders. I mean, we're not talking about multi-thousand dollar cameras. We're talking about a camera you buy at Walmart or Best Buy or your local electronics store, and they cost roughly about $200. And then we're going to run that app either on you, whatever cell phone you happen to be using or tablet and or your existing laptop. So in terms of hardware investment, you're talking about a $200 camera. Thanks, guys, for listening, and we shall be in touch. Thank you all very much. Take care.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.